All right, we'll reconvene, and I'd like to welcome to the stage our next speaker, Dr. Nancy White from the University of South Florida. Which also has something remotely resembling a football team for which we will do the survey on campus next month to make sure that no archeological sites will be harmed in the building of a football stadium on our campus. <laughs> All the things. Okay, my research is in the Apalachicola Lower Chattahoochee Valley region, which covers parts of Northwest Florida, Southeast Alabama, and Southwest Georgia. It's a very distinctive region environmentally and archeologically. It encompasses the lowest 50 miles, river miles of the Chattahoochee, and let me see, oh yeah, I love this green pointer. Okay, here's the Chattahoochee River. Goes all the way up to Atlanta. Lowest 50 river miles of the Chattahoochee, 25 miles of the Flint, 110 or so miles of the Apalachicola. A lot of tributaries, including the big Chipola River, about which more in a minute. Because the Chipola is very unusual. Here's the upper Appalach where we just did some field work in August, a very big alluvial river flowing from North Georgia. The tributary Chipola is very different with hard limestone banks and chemical differences that leave different patinas on the artifacts. Purple points. This valley region has some low hills some very high ravines on the east side, which you can see as the light band. It's also visible on the image on the cover of your programs. And <clears throat> mostly from the middle downward, it's low bottomland swamp, estuarine marsh, bay shores, and barrier islands, which surround the delta like a white sparkling necklace. Sub-drainage basins are different, you see in this picture on the right, but are connected. My research follows that of Clarence B. Moore, who came often in the early 1900s with a crew from Sop Choppy, and Harvard's Gordon Willie, who was working at Macon, Georgia, met a lady, Catherine, whose family vacationed in the Florida Panhandle he went along and found it archaeologically fascinating, and he married her too. <laughs> His Smithsonian book, Archaeology of the Florida Gulf Coast, is still the Bible in the region. Next, George's A.R. Kelly and his son-in-law, Joseph Caldwell, and Florida's Ripley Bullen worked here in advance of dam building. Then George Percy of Florida State welcomed my professor, Dave Brose, from the Cleveland Museum and his students, including me, to Northwest Florida archaeology. I've continued ever since with my own students for helpers. For this total 160 miles of river valley, we've surface collected agricultural fields in the upper valley, shovel tested in forested areas, found unusual large gastropod shell middens you see on the upper left around salty St. Joseph Bay, and trekked through nearly impassable forests and wetlands. Lower Valley Creeks, whoops, I went backwards. And nearly, <clears throat> and the glorious, gl glorious white sand beach barrier islands, which here demonstrate how quickly uh, sea level rise and anthropogenic factors are eroding them away. You can see my kid was exactly four feet tall when I took this. So he was a scale. That's the erosion on the barrier island. We even dewatered a couple shell midden sites with huge pumps hauled in by boat and also by helicopter. We've pushed into thick swamp forests full of poison ivy as all the green you see here in this slide, you never know what you're going to find in those swamps. <laughs> and of course, that is me on the left in my field <laughs> outfit. We've done huge amounts of public outreach with collectors sharing artifacts and knowledge. Here's a program at the Apalachicola Reserve with flint nappers and spear throwing and a, at a hay bale with a mammoth drawing. But 
You well know our ethical responsibilities include not only public archaeology, but publishing our results. You may have seen the latest Indiana Jones movie. <laughs> and here's the New Yorker illustration making fun of him as a geezer, forgetting which adventure he's on. But never do we have a reference to what he might have published on his res research. My most horrifying scene from that new movie is early on when he's in the collections facilities with shelves of beautiful artifacts, pots and everything, and the bad guys come in and you know what's gonna happen. All those shelves get pushed over on the bad guys. All the data and materials messed up. Luckily, I've overcome these problems by finishing a synthesis for my research region, two volumes to be out next year. So the rest of this talk is a commercial, I mean a synthesis of <laughs> those data so that you might be interested to read about it. Here is the time chart, crucial to understanding culture process over time. Glance at that and of course there will be a quiz at the end. The earliest dates on Paleo-Indian at over 14,000 are those from the wonderful Oscilla researchers just a couple valleys over. As you know, beyond archaeology, we have linguistic, biological, genetic evidence of the peopling of the Americas. How did these earliest people move onto the Gulf Coast? Did they have staging stations, as some say, or just move along as if you were moving to a better house a couple blocks away? Were they fearless pioneers or careful experimentalists? No idea, because we don't have the evidence so far. They certainly hunted big game, which we can support with the Oscilla data and some great fossils from the Apalachicola Chipola area. However, they probably mostly ate plants and small game. The stereotypes are horrible. So here's a book illustration with a happy mammoth nuclear family. <laughs> of course, they probably really traveled in herds led by the oldest female, like modern elephants, but I show this slide to make a point. They had no predators. They probably didn't worry when some little two-legged animal showed up there in the background. So the first Americans had, as you know, a free grocery store. You, many of you are hunters and fishers. You know those creatures. Know you are there. And so they try to get away. Not so for the first Americans. However, the stereo type of man, the hunter, or as one archaeologist put it, Rambo meets the megafauna, dies hard. And I don't just, I don't just mean that women hunted too, and I'm sure, of course they did, not in fur bikinis, but. And there are two brand new articles in the American Anthropologist on women as hunters, one giving biological information, women have more stamina to run animals down, another one giving archeological, so it's really good reading on women hunting. But for a multi-ton mammoth or bison, it's no different to gore a 200 pound guy or a 100 pound girl, you know? Probably hunting was cooperative. It's far easier to use nets as these Central African hunters still do. Beyond that, ethnographic and archeological data show Paleo-Indians certainly ate small game and plants. So, known Paleo points in my research region are now numerous thanks to collectors. The most common actually are unfluted Clovis and then later a lot of Dalton. Many unweathered points are eroding out of the barrier island shorelines like those on the lower right. From the Chipola River and the lower Chattahoochee, we also have waller knives, those unifacial notched flakes that might have been expedient tools, and also Oscilla adzes, both possibly Paleo-Indian. What's new is the model for the region. Waterway structure, all sites actually of all time periods, on the right is the map of the Pleistocene shoreline. On the left is the map of the sites in my region. First, yes, we have a lot of paleo sites from the lower Chattahoochee dredge boat workers. They hear them coming out of the screen. 
then we have this solid line of sites in the Chipola River because people dive there all the time. So I wish some of professionals maybe in this room would get over to the Chipola River like they have the Osceola. The Chipola may today flow in what was the old river channel of the Apalachicola, which keeps moving eastward. Here's the big river. Stream capture may have moved the big river eastward. Second, unlike earlier models proposed by archaeologists we won't name here, there is a lot of Paleo-Indian known on the modern coast, both the mainland shore and the barrier islands. Of course, the Pleistocene coast was way out there, so these were not coastal sites, but they're on relatively higher bay shores, probably what were then riverbanks. Finally, a few more sites are becoming known on the Apalachicola River proper. We know the river moving eastward covered all the ancient channels with alluvium, so we assume many paleocytes are very deeply buried. For example, JA2077 there on the map, the Calvin Foran site was uncovered when forester Calvin Foran scraped away a 20-foot hillside with his heavy equipment and discovered a spring, a cave, and this cool Clovis Point. By the Holocene, global warming and human action probably combined to make the megafauna extinct. Then we see tons of early archaic points, but so far, few stratified sites. Early archaic means notched points like the bowl and beveled in the lower right, and the Oscilla sites date them at 9,000. The site distribution maps may suffer, and all the rest of those were presumably middle archaic, who knows. Uh, but the site di distribution suffer not only from sites covered by that eastward moving river burying them, but also the confusion on what constitutes a middle archaic point, for example. Late archaic is easier. Here's that chart you were memorizing. With more certain dates and some new things, tiny micro tools and micro cores, and also the earliest pottery, fiber-tempered wares, so ugly only an archaeologist could love it. Spanish moss was mixed with the clay, and I got dates on the actual potsherd, on the unburned, undecayed fibers in the fiber-tempered pottery. It was hand-molded, flat-bottomed, and thick. Occasionally simple-stamped, though simple-stamped is not a transition into early woodland Deptford simple-stamped pottery, and actually may be older than the plain-surfaced fiber-tempered wares. At coastal and estuarine sites, we also have jasper bead, clay balls, poverty point, objects melon-shaped with finger ridges showing clear ties. Whoops, I wanted that ball to float in there. Clear ties to the poverty point culture of northeast Louisiana, which is there. <laughs> and if you look at the occurrence of these kind of poverty point type objects, it exactly mimics the hurricane evacuation maps for the Gulf Coast every year. So that tells you something, wetland adaptation. Whether from climate change or cultural change, we next get to early woodland adaptation with new kinds of points like these Hernandos, still spear points, other artifacts like shell beads and pots of clay not mixed with plant fibers but minerals, often made with four feet on the base, but we're scientists so we have to call them tetrapods. And uh, on the upper right you see a big one. Um, as well as simple stamped in straight lines and the first check stamp, which lasts then after that forever. Here's an early woodland marsh clamshell midden we tested. Whoops, come back. Um, recovering that kind of pottery and shell beads, bone artifacts. A significant finding is that when we get to early woodland, there's no difference in subsistence remains from the late archaic. People picked up new artifact styles, kept on doing the same thing for a living. Late in the early woodland period, people started building mounds and interring the dead with fancier artifacts. Here are the site distribution maps for early and middle woodland. You can see that by middle woodland times, 
AD 300 to 700. On the right, there are at least 40 burial mounds in the region. One innovation was complicated stamp pottery made by impressing carved paddles like these modern reproductions on the wet clay. They were still making Czech stamp pottery too, and we're participating in the Snow Vision World Engraved Project run by Karen Smith of the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, 3D scanning the stamp designs and then using machine learning to match them across the South to see relationships. On the right, you see more of the exotic middle woodland ceramics, early Whedon Island types that are both incised, uh, that are incised, cut out, made in animal and human shapes, often painted red, both the Swift Creek series pottery and the Whedon Island series pottery occur in Middle Woodland in this valley. There's no Swift Creek culture or Whedon Island culture. Other fancy and unusual objects characterize early and Middle Woodland copper ear discs, shiny mica cutouts made of materials imported from hundreds of miles away. Uh, here's a mundane bone pin, but also a clay figurine or rim effigy of a pointy-headed person. Cone heads, ancient cone heads, I don't know. Middle woodland people prized the fantastic, the exotic, and also, I think, objects that played with light. Whether shiny stones or cut-out vessels, they may be characterized by what Margaret Mead in New Guinea called neophilia, an obsession with novelty and delight in the new and unusual. More mundane pottery is incised, punctated on the lower left, a lovely stamped bird head motif, and in the bottom center, net marked with the left side, come back, no, come back, come back, come back. With the left side showing the modern clay positive impression, so we see various net and knot sizes. Despite fancy stuff, middle woodland people maintained their fisher hunter gatherer lifeways. Our excavation on St. Vincent Island oyster shell middens showed what they were really eating, of course, was fish. Rochelle Marinin, sitting here in the lovely audience, identified up to 80% of the fish bone as mullet, which is easy to get with those nets, along with some more unusual creatures like whale or dolphin. These coprolites on the upper right, you all know what a coprolite is. Don't make me say it out loud here at the podium. Uh, anyway, we got them identified by ancient, uh, through ancient DNA, and they are from dogs. And they're from a shell midden in the middle valley, and the coprolites are full of chewed up fish heads. So again, little subsistence change through middle woodland. By late woodland times, around AD 700, the elaborate material culture mostly disappeared and mundane check stamp ceramics continued. I think because indigenous peoples were beginning serious cultivation of crops and probably just didn't have the time. So finally, finally, subsistence does change. Of course, farming takes way more time than getting wild foods. The latest prehistoric period, I know you're still memorizing this chart, is called Fort Walton, the region's Mississippian cultural manifestation. Large agricultural centers dominated by flat top temple mounds developed in the region, though nothing as remarkable as Lake Jackson in Tallahassee. Here's one, oh, here's the map of where all the platform mounds are, and on the lower right you see one platform mound in, Ap in the Apalachicola Valley around 70 miles west of here, and here's one on the lower Chattahoochee um, about 90 miles northwest, in which you can see the huge amount of labor needed to renew these structures, perhaps with each new leadership, a new horizontal or vertical expansion. We have preserved maize, which had come in from Mexico, via the southwest probably, but people were still collecting wild foods like these charred acorns, and it looks like the abundant seafood on the coast meant no need to grow crops though we still have Temple Mount centers. Even with the new pottery and other uh, artifact styles, Fort Walton culture is very distinctive among Mississippians in the South with six-pointed open bowls, lack of shell temper in the ceramics, and also lack of many chipped stone tools. So what changed for these powerful chiefdoms to arise? 
An unsupported hypothesis is that of the big man, in which an individual, always male, is suddenly motivated to accumulate wealth and power. Here's Ron Muick's famous huge sculpture, I saw it in the Los Angeles Museum, uh, to show this model has no clothes. It depends on the Wall Street movie concept of the self-aggrandizer going after power and riches, an ethnocentric and sexist concept that comes right out of 20th century Western capitalism. But ethnographers have recorded egalitarian societies where social leveling mechanisms are always present and people ask, why would anyone want to go to so much trouble to get more stuff or more importance than they really need? A recent example is Suzman's uh, 2017 book, Affluence Without Abundance, about the Bushmen in Southern Africa. We know Fort Walton chieftains had matrilineal households with men marrying in and Spanish invaders encountered some female chiefs. These social issues are very hard to study in the Southeast because the early 1500s old world invasions quickly decimated Native Americans in this region, saw rapid decline of what apparently had been so many millennia of prosperity and peace. Fort Walton sites, a distribution on the left, shows hundreds of stream bank farmsteads, mound centers, but in the two centuries of invasion and colonization, most indigenous peoples died out. First from epidemics, the Spanish didn't even believe in bathing, and they also brought animal vectors for disease. And of course, from violence, here's Spanish war dogs tearing Indians apart. In fact, new genetic data show that European dogs soon completely replaced all Native American dogs. You may have read about that. The Spanish invaders' routes show they didn't get into the region, which is shown in pink, but their goods and germs did. There were two or three, I gotta go back here and show you, two or three Spanish missions around the forks of the Flint and Chattahoochee, only brief. But the British and then the Americans controlled much of the territory at the time that new Native Americans from farther north in Georgia and Alabama moved down river into this now mostly empty land. We don't know how many descendants of Fort Walton peoples might have been part of these groups who came to be called Creeks and then Seminoles. And by the way, they did play their own version of football. They made this homely brushed pottery and wore European clothing, not the minimal skirts, jewelry, and tattoos they had at the time of contact. They often joined with other persecuted groups and the region had the largest settlement of Maroons in the, Southeast, in the US, escaped slaves with their own cultures who set up this defense called Negro Fort, the big, big one. And Andrew Jackson then of course had it blasted away and grabbed the land from Spain and set up his own Fort Gadsden, the little structure in the middle of the big one to fight the Seminole Wars and remove all the Indians in the 1840s, even the Indians who helped him fight the other Indians. At the same time, the town of St. Joseph was founded by cotton merchant speculators as a rival to the city of Apalachicola. They imported the fanciest Staffordshire ceramics and French brandy. But this boom town was gone in under 10 years due to hurricanes, fires, yellow fever epidemic, Interesting, huh? Historic archeology span in the region demonstrates interesting environmental relationships. For example, two lost Civil War forts were built on the main riverbank and obstructions in the big river were supposed to halt the Union Navy so the Confederates could shoot them. But the Yankees never came. The obstructions made the river jump to a new channel leaving these two forts on this teeny little stream that's dry in winter, former riverbank. 19th century travel and commerce was still mostly by water, leaving many shipwrecks. Here's one on a barrier island, a late 1800s vessel with lumber or cotton for New England or Old England, and an early 1900s steamboat wreck on the Apalachicola, right across from the Fort Walton Mound Center at Chattahoochee Landing. Here's the Temple Mound right behind the trees. You can't really see it. But it's a great place to visit. They're fixing it up. 
Um, We've examined U.S. military training centers on the barrier islands during World War II, also apiaries for making the region's famous Tupelo honey. Except lately the trees are dying, uh, the bees are dying, and the trees are stressed from climate change. So it's hard to get Tupelo honey, even in Weewahitchka, should you know where that town is. 21st century sudden change means riverbank and shoreline archaeological sites like this barrier island shell midden that sat there for thousands of years are washing away rapidly. Look at the difference in how high the bank is. 2018's Hurricane Michael was huge. The local residents knew it was a Category 5 storm. They knew. Whereas the NASA didn't tell them that till months later. They already knew. 95% of the old growth forest was blown down, so, of course, great fires followed. Walls blew off houses. But when you drive by, you can look inside through the open framework and see that one artifact always remains. You can't quite see it in this picture, but it's white. Yes, the toilet, because it was bolted down. Equally serious is the archaeology of us moderns. We depend on plastic for everything, and we spew this horrible substance around at huge rates. This article knocked me out. Each of us, on average, ingests 74,000 microplastic particles per year. And if you drink bottled water, 90,000 more microplastic particles. So long after we ourselves have decayed, these will remain, making the archaeology of us horrifying but colorful. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>